All right, first thing I have to inform you of is Damien's been lying to you this entire time because he called this diversity training. And I don't do diversity training because all of my research in this area says that diversity training doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not diversity training, okay? <laughs> not diversity training. What, what I want to do is I'm going to have a dialogue. We're, we're going to have a dialogue together about uh, how to be more effective in the kingdom. Okay? So that's what this is, and that's what we're going to be doing. But uh, we're going to kick off by, by setting the tone. I said we're not here for diversity training. I have a ten and a half minute video that some of you may have even seen it. It's called A Thousand Questions. And it is going to illustrate why we are here today, right? Go ahead and play the video. How did it feel, God? 
When you walked this cracked shell of a planet, cried like a broken-hearted child, the perfection of what was supposed to be. Up against the brutality of our reality. says you gave up your life, your flesh, and your blood for love. And as the story goes, you're still reaching. You watch over the grieving. You capture every sigh. You measure the space between every heartbeat. And there's a promise that winds its way through every weathered page. A feast for the hungry, the delivery of the captives, healing for the desolate, the final satisfaction of justice, making all things new. Hope in the clinics where the sick hold on. Hope in the schools and the holding cells. It echoes in the halls of the hospitals. Hope rises up in the cities and the war zones. Hope in the courtroom and in the broken home. In the seminaries and the cyber highways. In the alleys of the homeless and the hungry. In the shack settlements and the compounds. On the farms where the soil is hard and dry. In the streets where the grieving mothers cry. Where the A's often stare up at the stars. Where the captives pound on the cell wall. Through the coal mine towns and the factories. In the ghettos and the prisons and the cemeteries. So where is it? I don't see it. I don't get it. The fulfillment of the promise. I don't see it down here in the middle of the fear. What hope can remain in the depth of this pain? I don't see it. The earth is groaning night and day, a song of human slavery, of dark disease and poverty, of children in captivity. God, that's the sound that comes to me. Are you still far away on high? Still staring out at that empty sky, still reaching out with that longing hand. I hear no voice and I don't understand. I know about theology. I know you gave your son for me. I know you're wrapped in mystery. I get invisibility, but I still see their misery. I hear their voices haunting me, saying who will come and set us free? Who will come and set us free? Who will come and set us free? Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Aquí estoy yo, envíame a mí. Still am I. Here am I. Here am I. I say, come be. Here am I. Let bake. Here am I. Let me be. 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 Let me be.
where am I? Nandito ako. Hier is ek. Here am I. Did he panel? Here am I. Maro ham befrist. Emerki. Here am I. Here am I. All right. Um, find three or four people at your table and just share one or two, three, one or two things you took away from that video. So just get in groups of four or five and just share one or two things that you took away from that video. I told you all I'm not here to do diversity training. I don't believe in diversity training. What I am here is to do a, a beginning small little dialogue about how can Ozark be a place that sends out all types of people to minister in all types of places throughout the world. That's, that's what we're talking about. Okay. How can this be a place that whatever student you draw here or find here or go get, because there's some you need to go get that you're not getting. Can you bring them in here and equip them so that you send them out to whatever situation that God has for them that they can be effective ministers of the gospel? All right? And so uh, what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to talk to you about three major challenges that an institution, a Christian institution, faces to being that place. And then just some beginning things concerning um, how maybe to respond to that. So this is, we're, we're cruising at 30,000 feet today, okay? This is a big overall picture, all right? So, brief biblical thought, extremely brief, okay? Um, so I'm not going to, we're not going to do a whole lot of theology here. I'm just going to operate on the assumption that uh, you know you should be doing this. <laughs> and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But we're not going to be doing a whole lot of theology today. Okay? Uh, overview of the Bible talks about from a family feud towards a family reunion. Were any of you in the, the reconciliation ministry presentation? If you were in there... That's my theological treatise. If you weren't in there, help send my oldest to college and buy my book, and it's in there, okay? <laughs> everybody, Damien, everybody always laughs at that, but I'm serious. <laughs> she wants to go to Calvin. Calvin costs $40,000 a year, so she's probably not going to Calvin, unless y'all buy a lot of books, so. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's another thing. From, from biblical perspective. We are never asked to have a generic notion of non-ethnic Christianity. Do you all realize that? The Bible is full, but, but the Bible wants you to see the ethnicity from the Old Testament through the New. You always know what ethnic group is being dealt with and talked about and how it's being adjusted and, and how Christ in his ethnicity uh, affected the way that he did things and, and how he was teaching. You know, I talked a little bit in, in the sermon about the Samaritans. You know, he went through Samaria on purpose because he knew there were ethnic conflicts. You know, we've never been asked to have this non-ethnic notion. Third thing, we are called to be ambassadors of reconciliation. 
of all types. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, somebody said it over here, that we live in a broken world. And where we find the brokenness, we need to be able to engage that brokenness and bring uh, the heart of God to that situation. So that's just a brief, brief biblical thoughts. So now let's get into the barriers. Here are the three main things, not the only things, but the three major challenges that a Christian institution faces when it comes to becoming a place that prepares people to minister to all people. Could take you back. <laughs> How old was I in that picture? 19. Who's guessing? 19. 17. Summer of 1987 is 100 pounds ago, at least. <laughs> That's my parents' basement. And we're going to talk about the first challenge called the challenge of ethnic borders. I'm going to tell you a story about this. My best friend, John Gable, who just, you know, we're still Facebook friends. And he just <laughs> issued a challenge to me because he's done it. He said, I just got back to our high school, my high school weight. You, you, you need to do that. I'm like, you win, because I'm not. <laughs> but I have been inspired to drop 20 pounds, because he looks great, man. He's dropped all this weight. I'm like, dude, I'm not, that's not going to happen. But I could, I could drop some. But uh, we, we were best friends, all right, and grew up in the late 80s. A uh, little bit of background about my family. Uh, both of them are from Alabama. My dad's from Aniston, Alabama. My mom's from Eufaula, Alabama. Any Alabama people in here? All right. So they grew up in Alabama. Uh, my mom was a farm girl. I told you I was a military brat. When dad retired in Columbus, Ohio, we lived on the east side of Columbus, and the east side of Columbus was an ethnic enclave. Okay? None of the white kids on the east side of Columbus called themselves white. They were Yugoslavian. They were Greek. And I forget the other ethnicity, but the two main ones, well, Serbian. It was Serbian, not Yugoslavian. It was Serbian and Greek. That were the two major enclaves. And so um, I had a very multi-ethnic upbringing, being, upbringing, being on military bases and, and growing up on the east side of Columbus. And so one day, uh, I'm downstairs in this basement with John, and we're playing Atari. Is Atari even still around? <laughs> we're playing Atari, and we got our, our hip-hop uniform on. If you don't know what the early 80s hip-hop uniform on, it was the Run DMC uh, blue jeans, Levi blue jeans, Levi uh, blue jean jacket, shell toe Adidas. They're like, what's shell toe Adidas? Well, I, you just had to be there. I can't tell you. <laughs> shell toe Adidas. I had a big earring. Believe that. Big old gold earring. I mean, we're just down there. I got my gear on. He's got his gear on. And we get a call from Joe Malagreca. He's an Italian punk rocker. Okay, so he has a mohawk. <laughs> right? And he's like, hey, it's my girlfriend's birthday. Her name was Shelly Yi. Okay? And, and she's Chinese. He said, we're, we're going out to eat, man. You guys want to come? He's like, yeah, we do, but I don't have a car. We don't have a car. He said, no problem. I got dates for you and everything. <laughs> so uh, they're going to come. We're going to swing by. We're going to pick you up. Right? And we're going to go to a restaurant. We're like, okay. So we're down there. Doorbell rings. It was our dates there to pick us up. So we come upstairs. And my mom's at the door, and she's doing her southern hospitality. You know all about that, right? The southern hospitality. Hey, ladies, how you doing? All that stuff. And it's two white girls. One has red hair, and one has blue hair. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the visual. So there's mom at the door doing her southern hospitality. Two white girls, one red hair, one blue hair. Uh, me, John Gable, with our hip-hop gear and attire. And mom just has this look of, like, terror on her, on her face because she just does not know what's going on. <laughs> so we, hey, bye, Mom. We go out. We have a good time. And I come home, and Mom's waiting up. Well, this is unusual, right? And she's like, I have to have a talk with you, son. I say, what's the talk? And she starts talking, and this good Baptist woman turns into Louis Farrakhan <laughs> right <laughs> before my eyes. <laughs> she is, it's every other word is black. It's black this and black kids that and you need to be black and black and black, 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 black. And I'm like, 
what is she talking about? Because <laughs> this good Baptist woman loves Jesus and went to church every day. She had ethnic borders that I, her son didn't have. Now, you can just imagine, you fall Alabama. It sounds like it is. Okay? I mean, they just integrated the prom down there maybe five, six years ago. Okay? So, uh, you know, this is just blowing her mind. You know, ethnic borders is, you can't really see it, it's cultural traits that define ethnic identity for both ourselves and others. And we have these ethnic borders. Typically, it goes like this. People of color have overt conversations about their ethnic borders. You ever heard the term, um, what does it mean to be black? If you ever heard that as a white person, you're probably like, what are they, what are they talking about? Right? That's an open conversation about ethnic borders. If you can remember back when Obama first ran for president, those of you who follow politics, do you remember this narrative when he was a candidate? Is he black enough? Y'all remember that? And prayer, you, some of you were like, well, you look black enough to me, right? <laughs> they, they were not talking about his skin. They were talking about this. Because his narrative is he's second generation immigrant, He's from Hawaii, he has an international background, and he's Ivy League educated. His wife's narrative, South Side of Chicago. If he was from the South Side of Chicago, that conversation would not have been happening. Because that would have fit within the media narrative of what a black person is supposed to look like and be and come from. He did not fit that narrative, so they were like, is he black enough? Right? Because we all, whether or not we have these or not, we all, whether or not we acknowledge these or not, I should say, we all have values, attitudes, and beliefs that derive from our ethnic heritage. And even if, if you say, well, I'm just white, that's okay, you got it too. <laughs> Y'all just don't label it this. It, it's coded. You label other things. Unless, like I serve in the Evangelical Free Church of America, which has Scandinavian roots, okay? And so everybody's last name is either S-O-N or S-E-N. I forget which one. One's from Norway, one's from Sweden. I, I forget. But, uh, you know, they talk about, you can read the church annals, and they'll talk about the discussions about how the Norwegian church is selling out because they're having English services now. You know, I mean, it's just fascinating stuff to read because it was all about the, the ethnic borders and the cultural traits that were there and how they're trying to navigate all that. That's a big part. If you understand that you have ethnic borders and figure out how to navigate those, that's half the battle. But most Christians, we don't even acknowledge that we have them. There is such a thing as the black church in the Korean church, in the Mexican church. People go, oh, that's just the church of Jesus Christ. That gives you nice applause at, at conferences. But it ain't real. There are things because of ethnic borders and, and things of that nature that make something a black church or a Korean church or, or lean towards, you know, white folks say, oh, we have a contemporary church. That means white church. Nobody in the black church says they have a contemporary church. <laughs> That's what I mean by coded language. Y'all understand? We have contemporary. No, that means white. That's the way white people do it. <laughs> I dare you to find a black church that has contemporary on its bulletin. Bring me one. They don't have it. <laughs> it's just coded language. It, it's, this is the way we do church. It's not necessarily bad. It just needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be acknowledged. All right? Okay, so you've got your, you got your group picked out, right? So you go back to your group. And um, once you... To answer these questions, you can pick whichever one you feel the most comfortable in answering and discussing amongst your group. Okay? First one is assign a number, 1 to 10, on how strongly you identify with your ethnicity. Two, does the notion of eth and, and by the way, white folk, if, it's, if you're a 10, it doesn't mean you're racist. Okay? 
I, I just, I've been doing this, and I find that people of color, I, yeah, I'm Mexican, yeah, I'm black. White folk are, like, scared to put a tin on it because they think, well, if I'm tin, that means I'm in the Klan. No. <laughs> That's not what it means. It just means you identify. And some of you, some of you have Italian heritage or Irish. That's fine. Some of you, you Ozark Mountain people. Yeah, moonshine and all that. Yeah. By the way, I can say that because my grandpa used to run shine, okay? So I'm with you. <laughs> all right. Does the notion of ethnic borders resonate with you? Why or why not? What I just talked about, that we all have borders, we all have values, attitudes, and beliefs based on ethnicity. Um, how easy or hard is it for you to accept that part of your value system comes directly from your ethnic identity? Okay? You can pick any one of those questions you feel most comfortable with, but I just ask you to follow one thing. Everybody in your group talks. <laughs> Please, don't clam up. Just, you know, your GPA is not affected by this. You know, just, just share with your neighbor where you're at. All right, I'm going to give about 10 minutes for this, so time yourselves accordingly, okay? So everybody, go around the group, four or five folk, pick a question. And just talk about it amongst yourselves, okay? All right. Okay. Did, if you picked um, number one, if you pick question number one and you feel comfortable in, sh in sharing what you said about question number one, assigning a number. Let's have some folks share that with the broader group. Question one. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay. <coughs> now it's a big deal, right? Like what was what were some of the values and attitudes and beliefs you derived from being in an Italian Catholic family? Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, my, my friend, I told you, Joe Malagreca, he was Italian. I mean, to be Italian, you had to be Catholic. So if you decide you're not Catholic, that like messes with your Italian. <laughs> All right? Does it not? Absolutely. Yes, sir. I would just like to know that as I listened to Mary and watched her, maybe the Italian had more influence than you think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will, Mary, I will have you know that I have been made an honorary Italian more times. I mean, every time, I like you, you know. <laughs> I said, I know, yeah. Yes, sir. I grew up Italian as well. My, my grandma's full Sicilian. And, okay. And I remember in junior high when that became strange because we'd get together for, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving on my mom's side of the family, and I would greet everybody, and we would just greet each other by, like, kissing on the lips. About junior high with male cousins, I was like, Whoa, this is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we all were like, this is weird because nobody else's families do this, but it was just normal and natural. And I remember my grandma grieving at a uh, cousin who died, uh, was murdered, and her almost climbing in the casket and mm. grieving and touching the body. And I thought, this is just not normal to me in the way that the rest of my friends were. Uh, yep. Members, so. Yeah. And we're loud and obnoxious. <laughs> Mary and I get along quite well. You get quite well? 
Okay, now, so let's talk just a little bit of like, like how something like that, just something small like that, how, how if you're in the wrong institutional culture, that might cause issues. Why is Mary so loud at every meeting? Why is she so demonstrative? All right? Right? And, and I say that because that's what people say about Alvin. Why is he so loud? When you preach, you don't have to shout at us, right? But if you've been in a traditional African-American church, we get excited, right? So we bring ourselves to the institution and the table. Can you see how some things just could get off kilter? Just for the simple fact of the ethnic values that you bring to the table and how you might express them and you just, and, and for you it's normal. And for everybody else, they're like, oh my gosh, why, you know, why, oh my, you know? Right? Thank you for sharing. Uh, who, did, who did number two? Get a couple people to share about what they, they said number two. Yes, sir. hanging out together is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, in some spaces, it's much needed. It's much needed. 
Uh, I had, had lunch at, um, what was that wing place we went to? Hackett's. We went to Hackett's. <laughs> And because when I come to place, when I come to places like this, I always ask, can we have a lunch with the students of color? And um, in a place where they're anywhere from four to seven percent of the population, they need to hang out together. They need it. It's not a bad thing in that particular context and situation. They need to hang out. All right. What about the third question? Third question. Who answered that one? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was telling them that this has kind of been a last you know, four or five year journey for me, just accepting that this is a reality. Um, and I was saying it's almost kind of like the first time you realize you have an accent. You're like, I don't have an accent. Like, you have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> but then realizing that, that, yeah, actually, a lot of my values do derive from the ethnic identity. And it's just because I've never had me in a position where I had to wrestle with some of these issues of ethnic identity that I didn't realize how much of anything this issue would work. So for me, I don't know if it's hard to accept, but it's more of a progressive revelation that this is a reality, that ethnicity will play a, a role in what I value and how I function. Yep. Uh, possibly or <laughs> Yep. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I guess you would call it a code word. We talk about traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of that comes from the ethnic backgrounds of your family. If you're Italian, you do things this way. But we do it this way because we're Italian. We're, you know, Irish, or German, or you know, Slavic, whatever. Um, where I grew up, we used to have ethnic festivals every weekend down the waterfront, and you celebrated the differences in ethnicity. And you went to celebrate you know, the things of that culture. But there's still that division. But when we hand down those value systems, sometimes we call them traditions, but it's because of our ethnicity and what is those ethnicities may be valued over what another ethnicity does in certain ways. Yeah. Most of the things that come, not all, but most of the things that come from our ethnic <coughs> upbringing, our identity, are values neutral. Not bad. Food you eat, you know, the clothes you wear, the uh, language you speak, you know, all these different things. Most of it is values neutral. But the, what, what the world does is they take those things and they use it as divisiveness. That's the trick of the enemy. Divisiveness. When I came to Cincinnati Christian University from, from Bowling Green, and at that time they had chapel, and in chapel, you was supposed to be rally, rally quiet, but nobody told me, okay? So I go to chapel, it's me and this other black guy, man, he's like over in the corner, and uh, this, this is like my first chapel, and this, this, this lady gets up, and she sings this beautiful song, it's wonderful, it's great, and it's, and it's like 600 kids, and me and the other black guy, yeah, everybody's like, looks, it's like, What's wrong with y'all? It was a good song. <laughs> and then the, the, the chaplain at that particular time came up to the mic and he said, you know, let's make sure that we reverence the Lord. <laughs> right? So that's the first time I found out that it was sinful to clap when somebody <laughs> sings. I mean, we laugh, but think about it. Think about that. What does that do to my identity? Right? It's not like I got up and, and cussed or anything. I, we clapped. And it's so funny today because now you go to Cincinnati Christian University and they got all these things. Yeah, you know, they're waving hands and doing all this stuff. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> Like, you have got to be kidding me. But, all right. First big challenge, ethnic borders. Second one, challenge of, of racialization. And let me explain to you what I mean by racialization. Racialization is a society wherein race matters for differences in life experiences, life opportunities, and social relationships. 
So let's first, let, let's talk a brief history about race and how that even came into our, our vernacular, all right? Um, before the Enlightenment period in history, we really did not categorize people by race, okay? Uh, if you look in the Bible, the notion of race is not present. It's the notion of ethnic groups, ethnos, enclaves, nationalities, okay? Your, your geographic region and the cultural and the values that we just talked about before, that's how people were necessarily basically categorized. Race came into being when a science began to be uh, discovered called anthropology, right? And what they used to do is they would pick arbitrary physical features, skin color, eye color, you know, nose length, feet, and they would measure and they would compare as, as what they thought was hard science at the time to try to create different species, like animals have different species. They were trying to figure out different species of human beings. And the biggest proponent and the one who introduced it into the American consciousness was Thomas Jefferson, okay? In terms of categorizing people by race, all right? So now, as time goes on and science gets better, they begin to figure out that at the end of the day, skin color doesn't really decide anything. Uh, eye color doesn't either. And, and nose, you know, the length of your nose or the size of your head, you know, that you can't really, there's no such thing as different species of people. Because this is an old racial map, how they used to try to categorize people. You know, <coughs> Caucasian, Negroid, Mongoloid, and so forth and so on. And then finally they figured out, you know what, this, this really is terrible as a classification system because you really, I mean, what do you do with Middle Eastern folk? Right? They got dark skin, but they got quote unquote Caucasian white features. Okay, so at the end of the day, they begin to figure out this is not really useful. Okay? That's hard science. However, what, what ends up happening though is from a social perspective, race still matters very profoundly. And judgment calls and things are made based on the false science of, of decades and, and, and generations ago. So the, rea the fact of the matter is, if, if I need a blood transfusion, it doesn't matter a hill of beans whether you're white or whether you're Latino or whether you're from Japan. What matters is your blood type and whether it will work in me. So there's, there's no physical traits based on, there's no difference based on physical traits like skin color and things of that nature. That's just not true. You know, it just isn't. You know, people put, they try to put all kinds of things. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, blacks, they jump higher. I, I've heard this. Blacks jump higher because they have an extra muscle in their calf. <laughs> that used to be a common belief. Just look up the history. I mean, it's crazy. All this stuff. It's not true. It's not true. So race, I bio, race as biology is pretty much dead. However, race is what they call social construct is very much alive, and that's why race matters. And racialization is that process of, of how socially things affect us because of that failed science. So, you know, it's, it, it does matter. You can't just ignore it because it doesn't exist biologically because it, it definitely exists socially. I, I, it's, it's just like this. It's, um, I was a kid, and I mentioned this in one of my classes, that my parents deceived me with the Santa Claus myth, okay? So from the time I was up till nine, 10 years old, I believed in Santa Claus like you would not believe. And I, to this day, remember Mrs. Smith in my fourth grade class around Christmas time. No, she didn't do what you think she did. <laughs> she, she had us have a debate. She said, which kids believe in Santa Claus? 
raised her head, which kids do not believe in Santa Claus, they raised their head, and she said, put your arguments and stuff together about why there's a Santa Claus and why there isn't a Santa Claus. And I was on the Santa Claus, you know, and I'm writing my essay, and we're getting our stuff together, and we're debating back and forth, and I'm like, you know, all I know is I write a letter, and when I put in it, Dad takes it to the mailbox, and I wake up on the 25th, and everything I put in that letter is under my tree. Now explain that, right? <laughs> Because my parents did it up. I would wake up, there would be, if it snowed, there would be like water from wet snow from the door to the tree. And you did the cookie thing and the cookies would be gone. And you know, and dad would be like, see, Santa came. And all. so I was just like, Santa, yes. Right? Then when I was 10 years old, I'll never forget this. There used to be this, this uh, toy store called Children's Palace. Okay. Dad picked me up once from school, and we went to Children's Palace, and he said, we got to go in, we got to get your little sister Santa Claus gifts. I'm like, what? <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's like, yes, we have to get her. And he said, you better not tell her. I said, well, wait a minute. No. <laughs> Nobody's told me. And, you know, my dad, bless his heart, blue collar, Old military guy, look, boy, I don't have time for this. Your mama is the Santa, your daddy is the Claus. Let's go. <laughs> and that's how I found out there was, I'm still scarred, you can tell. That's how I found out there's no Santa Claus. Because it was a social construct in my head. And up until, I don't care what you told me, I believe that there was a Santa Claus. And that's how race operates today. It doesn't matter what the racial science says. People believe and they will go to their grave thinking that because I have black skin, I am a different species or whatever. There's just different. I don't care what they say. You know, no, I, I've seen those people. They, they're different. Right? And racialization is when you get into the hot topic debates about policing. And those types of things. And, and when you, you know, I got myself in trouble because our denomination, I wrote a blog about why we should care about Ferguson. Okay? And in my blog, I used some personal anecdotes about police. You know, I talked about the time my wife was, she grew up in, in Cleveland, and when she was uh, uh, 9 or 10 years old, the cops kicked down her door and made her family get spread eagle, and they were looking for her, her brother, and, you know, and it was just all big mistake, and they didn't even get apologized to. It was just like, you know, shut up about it, you know, and they left. And I talk about how my uncle in Columbus was part of a lawsuit because he was pulled over driving while black, and they found a pattern. DWB, it's a real phenomenon. And they found a pattern, and he had to testify. And the Columbus Police Department had to be totally, completely, you know, revamped. Because they found, if you were driving, and he has a nice car, he drives a Benz now, and if you were a black male, and you were driving a nice car in that particular time in Columbus, they were going to pull you over. It just was going to happen. Two, three years ago, I talked to a family who, who's a white family, adopted an a, a African-American son. He, they, in Blanchester, Ohio, live in Blanchester, Ohio. He's a high schooler. He, he, drives from, he drives a particular road from Blanchester to Mason to work in a movie theater. In one summer, and you're going to think I'm kidding, in one summer, he was pulled over 33 times. 33 times. And, and they were just freaking out because they were like, what is this? racialization so now but but see here's what happens because this is what happens in the comments on my blog um well that happened to me <laughs> did it happen to you 33 times and people try to explain away life experiences it's like no you you have different life experiences based on your your race and your social class and your gender you you have different life experiences and that that needs to be acknowledged and discussed and talked about why we have these different life experiences and, and what's the proper response to it as a body of Christ. That's what this is about, right? It's not about picking sides. That's what some commentators do. You're picking sides. It's not picking sides. 
This is a real deal. All right? So, when it comes to race, uh, three questions. You can pick one just like the other time. How do you classify yourself racially? What criteria did you use to come up with your answer? How has your race affected your perspective on life? How has your race affected your faith? Right? So take 10 minutes, pick one of those questions to answer and discuss among yourselves. Let's have four or five people just share whatever question that you picked and, and, and what you shared with the group. I'll go first. Yes. Um, question number one is, I don't feel like I classify myself racially. I feel like I have been classified. Yep. Um, I, I mean, I'm white, but I'm also male, Christian, heterosexual. You know, I'm, I'm kind of the top of the pyramid. <coughs> I know that because I have been told that. Although I don't really know what that means, yep. except off of the stories of other people who don't like what I have. Um, and so when I look at that, I think, how do we live as Christian people mm -hmm. who have certain kinds of resources or certain kinds of things handed to us by a system that's not equitable? And I think, you know, when I look at myself racially, I never looked at myself as white, ever. You know, which is really different growing up in the majority culture. Um, and it's only recently that I would say that, you know, I just kind of look at myself a little bit more from that standpoint, because it's never been bad to be white until recently. You know, when, when we're looking at kind of this resource thing. So the criteria that I've used is, I'm kind of using, um, I, I don't know what it means to be white, because it's not ever been bad to be white, other than when I read things, you know, about white, white privilege or white power, um, those are things that I just kind of have to mull over because I'm the child of a system that gave me that. And I'm trying to figure out what is a good Christian response to my racial classification. Yeah, thank you for sharing. You know, it's like, it's, it's a result of, you know, a lot of times white Christians are like, oh, you're trying to demonize me. It's like, no, the like way you articulated it's, it's a result of Genesis 3. It's a result of the fall. And it's, it's an understanding that um, wherever our biography takes us, wherever we go and we have a physical presence, there's this, his, there's this history that's with us whether we like it or not. It's just there. It's like the backdrop. So it's a matter of if we know that this is the historical backdrop with us, well, how do we position ourselves in different contexts and how do we, we figure out how to deal with that? Not to fight it or get mad or get angry. Again, we're talking about the church. That's what the world does. They get mad. They get angry, they get even. You know, we, we don't do that. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to be peacemakers. Thanks for sharing. Yes, sir. I think anytime you're a part of the majority <coughs> group in culture, you normally don't think about <coughs> race that much. Yeah. Uh, until you end up not being in the majority. Uh, when we were in Africa, we were the ones getting pulled over. Yeah. Every time we were out there. We There's were nothing the, moral in skin color, is yeah, there? Yeah, there was a, we were the rich European slash American folk, and so yep. pull them over, and they're good for a 20. There you go. Uh, and uh, so it's a little bit different when you're not in the majority racial group. Oh. Yep. I'd like to what Peter was saying. You know, I think as a result of that, a lot of us feel that, you know, guilt that's kind of been put upon us because, um, because we are the, you know, privileged or whatever. And it's like, we didn't, you know, we didn't do anything to deserve that, but yet we were carrying that guilt with us, you know, the yeah. guilt of, and I don't know, it's kind of difficult to know how to, how to handle that. Yes, sir. Yeah, on the number one, my wife and I talk about this quite a bit, and we have to fill out forms. And I would say, how do you classify yourself racially? I'd say cheated. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. 
you get to choose African American, Native American, Hispanic, Chinese, Japanese, or white. And there's a whole lot of difference between a Frenchman and a German, and an Englishman and an Italian and a Czechoslovakian, but it's like you're not allowed to celebrate your heritage or you know your ethnicity. You're just purposely grouped into one category. There's a whole history behind how white people came white. In fact, I think there's like a book somewhere about that title, like hmm. how, you know, if you look at the history of census, like for instance, did you all know that Latinos used to be white? Did you all know that? Yeah. They used to be considered white, and then something happened like, no, y'all are white, right? <laughs> at the beginning okay let me tell you how you made your decision you had to do this I tricked you I forced you to do this <laughs> you had to look at me and you had to stereotype you had to you had no other thing to do you had to look at my physical being you had to look at my skin color and what you knew about me and this that the other uh, what sociologists tell us is that um, when we see people we size them up and we, and we immediately have these tapes in our head that start to play and tell us about that individual and we cannot stop it. They're, they come on. So as soon as I see Kathy, my tapes come on. And whatever's in my life experience about white, younger, <laughs> females, <laughs> Kathy served me well, y'all. She's younger. <laughs> um, whatever, whatever is in my good, bad, whatever's in my mind, they play. It plays. You can't stop it. It plays. So the key is you have to figure out how to suspend your root assumptions enough to account for what you said and say, well, let me not just put this woman in a box. 
Let me engage and get to know her and understand before I just say, oh, she's just like Mrs. Smith, my fourth grade teacher. There's an there's a old uh, sociology professor by the name of Gordon Alport who came up with um, a theory of how you overcome prejudice. And it's called positive contact theory. And there's a couple proponents of it, okay? And basically what he says is to, because of those tapes, the really the only way that you can overcome the negative things and the stereotypes that society puts on you is to have positive cross-cultural experiences to have something to balance that out. That's why just about every person who I've known, you know, if, if I, I figured out, I've been around here long enough to know that Travis is the guy when it comes to this, all right? Travis ain't even paid for this, and Travis does it, right? I think I figured that out. And I, only, I haven't talked to Travis but once or twice, but I bet you if I had 20 minutes with Travis, I could tell you that Travis has had many positive cross-cultural experiences. Is that true? Naturally in his life. And because he has had that, he can see clearly when it comes to this. And he has many more positive tapes going on in his brain than negative tapes. That's why he can see it, he can zero in, he can go. Most people who are hung up with this stuff, what don't they have? Positive life experiences. They don't have it. Or any experiences. So, if you feel like being a nerd like me, look up Gordon Alport or just type in Google positive contact theory. Many people have written on it and talked about it because that is the main way forward. That's why those of you pastors, when, when you have a family who's a pew sitter, they don't do anything but get on your nerves, right? <laughs> they go on a cross-cultural field trip for two weeks and they come back and they're on fire. Because all of a sudden, they've been activated cross-culturally, and they've had these positive experiences. They've seen their faith used, and, and now they want to talk to you about how come you're such a stick in the mud, and why haven't you been on a missions trip, and how come we're not downtown tutoring kids, and all you're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I couldn't get you to show up at church more than twice a month, you know, before this mission trip. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you're on fire? Positive contact theory. They, they've done studies on what is one of the biggest things that causes people to mature in their faith. It's cross-cultural contact. Cross-cultural contact is one of the things. So if you wanted to build a, like a disciple-making pathway within your church and helps mature people in their faith, you'll have a cross-cultural experience somewhere in that pathway because it spurs them. Go forward. If you don't do the ugly American thing, okay? That's a whole nother presentation. We won't do that. All right, we want to take a quick, quick, everybody repeat after me, quick. quick. Five minute stand up break. If you got to use the bathroom, run out and use it because we've got to wrap up by 3.30. It's 2.57. We are starting back up at 3.02 sharp. Okay, so everybody please come right back so we can finish up. <laughs>